We have a, a letter from George and Sue. And so I want to read this because they watch us on YouTube. Hi, George. Hi, Sue. Hi, YouTube people. Mike, is, is Mike and, and Melissa watch us on YouTube down in the, the great state of South Carolina. Where my, mo my, my mom, hi mom, <laughs> Beth, Sarah, Val, my cousin, let me see, Mike, my cousin, uh, let me see, I better get everyone, I'm going to get, I always forget something, I'm always in trouble, trouble's my middle name, but that's okay, Jesus is on my side, he's my friend, Amen. but uh, here is a note from uh, George and Sue, it says, hello precious friends, finishing up our time here in Tennessee with our son and his family, the first week in July. And we'll start north through Ohio, New York, and over to Mass. Ex we expect to arrive after the 18th of July, so we will see you then. Our best to all of you. Can't wait to see you all again. Fondly, Sue and George. So thank you, Sue and George. And, and, and let's pray for their traveling mercies as well. Father, we lift up George and Sue. We ask that we give them traveling mercies as they rejoin us on July 18th. We pray that you bring them safely. And Lord, we thank you for healing Sue's hip. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's grab our Bibles and turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And today we are going to be talking about victory. And I hope that this message is a message of joy to you. I hope this is not a message of controversy. Because to me, it's not controversial at all. It's fact. And we're going to be taking a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 50, and we're going to read through the end of the chapter. It says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. We do say hallelujah for being our victory, for giving us triumph over sin and death and hell. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to open our eyes, Lord God, as this is a very common, well-known passage to a lot of people. Father, I pray that we would be able to see a little bit deeper into it than what we're used to. Father, I pray that the familiarity of it would not jade our hearts, but instead that our hearts would be circumcised by your Holy Spirit, that he would open up our ears, that we may hear what he is saying to us, the church, this day, and that we may obey the word of God as we walk in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we ask this. Amen. Amen. Our final victory. I don't know about you, but I am an end time results kind of guy. I'm a football fan. And I am very passionate about football. But I'm not one of those fans that gets all jacked up about the draft. To me, the draft is just a step in the right direction. And the regular season, although fun and enjoyable, is not the final thought in my mind. My thought is Super Bowl or bust. <laughs> I'm not happy with my team unless they are hoisting the Vince Lombardi trophy as world champions of the football world. 
I like results. That's why I can appreciate um, my country friends who have the theme, get her done. You know? I love that fact, that, they, that there's that attitude. Get her done. Well, I'm here to tell you that we have a God who gets it done. Amen. And he always supernaturally hoists the Vince Lombardi trophy of victory because he is the ultimate champion of them all. And so we're going to take a look at our final victory. And that's the title of, of my sermon. And my thesis is this. God gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you try to attain victory any other way than other through King Jesus, whom our good patriot brother says, we will have no king but King Jesus. If you try to have victory in any other name, with any other person, in any other religion, you will fail. You will fail. And for those of you who don't like that, I quote the Borg, resistance is futile. You will be assimilated one way or the other. Amen. <laughs> Either into the kingdom of God and victory or cast into hell where you were burned for all eternity in eternal regret. God gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. My three points are this. First, we're going to take a look at the mystery. Then we're going to take a look at the transformation. And then we're going to finally take a look at the victory because this is all about victory. You know, and as I was worshiping today, I just felt like Satan was trying to put a wet blanket on us today. He's been trying to put a wet blanket on me all the way up that mountain, right? As I hopped into my car, you know, and I was running a little late, and I looked down, and, and the gas tank was almost empty. I'm like, rah, 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 rah. I gotta stop and get gas. You know, and so I take my sunglasses off, and they broke. And I'm like, rah, 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 I gotta get gas and replace sunglasses, you know? And on top of it, these last two weeks, I am beat. I've been working my little fingers off uh, delivering fish and teaching Bible studies and preaching. And, and so I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm a little exhausted right now, but I also know what the Word of God says. In our weakness, His strength is made perfect. So we'll let, we'll let God's strength be perfect. And so we're going to take a look at the mystery, the transformation, and ultimately the victory. And go with me to verse 50. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. And this is a lesson that the world needs to learn. We as flesh and blood people cannot, will not, ever be able to inherit the kingdom of God. And right there, that tells us that all other religions are a waste of time because you can't meditate your way to heaven. You can't do good enough, enough good works to get to heaven. You can't, you know, whatever, give enough money to get to heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I, even as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, I am painfully aware of how inadequate my flesh is. Because if, if, if it was dependent upon my righteousness, which comes from my flesh, I'm in big trouble. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because God showed us in the garment, in the garment, excuse me, in the garden, <laughs> He showed us in the garden that in order for man to be redeemed, he would must be redeemed by a, an innocent, perfect, sinless sacrifice. It's alluded to in Genesis 3.15. And the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. An allusion to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Who, by the way, John the Baptist, the real high priest of his day, Proclaim, behold, the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. We need a supernatural agent to save us. Buddha was a man, sinful. Muhammad was a man, sinful. Mao was a man, sinful. Marx was a man, sinful. None of these, Hitler was a man, sinful. And none of those men are the way to God. Jesus made it very clear when he said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. Now, when I was witnessing to my relatives, they tried to say, well, that's your interpretation. And I go, excuse me? That's my, well, yeah, that you, that's your, I'm like, well, no, no, no. That's not my interpretation. That is a direct quote of Jesus Christ. I didn't interpret that. I didn't say, well, in the Greek, you know, this means interpretation, you know, and this means the way, this means, no. I simply quoted something that Jesus himself said. He said he was the only way, the only truth, the only life, and you can't get to the Father except through him. And so flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is a mystery to a lot of people. But... Not to you guys, because you guys are well-versed in the scriptures. You know that flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. We really only did this for the YouTube people out there, right? You know, oh, oh, wait a minute. Sorry, YouTube people. A lot of you out there are also very sophisticated. You know that, too. But maybe some of you are out there aren't. And you think there is another way. And I'm here to tell you, there is no other way. You can't inherit the kingdom of God unless you go through Jesus Christ. Amen. And we have a blurb at the end of every, every uh, sermon about how to get saved. And I, I point you to that. It's, it talks about Jesus Christ coming into your heart. The most wonderful event you'll ever have occurred to you. Period. Bar none. But anyways, in verse 51, Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, some people want to say, well, you know, mystery to us means we don't know what he's talking about. But this word mystery here comes from the Greek word mysterion, which means I am now showing you something that once was in ages past hidden. And that's where uh, these theologians get the, the, the phrase that the New Testament is in the Old Testament revealed. Because in the Old Testament, there are parts of the Old Testament that talk about salvation, talk about the rapture, talk about the second coming, talk about the Messiah and who the Messiah is. And a lot of people who read the Old Testament, they didn't know who the Messiah was. A lot of people who read the Old Testament, I don't think realize that in Isaiah, at the end of Isaiah chapter 26, that Isaiah is talking about the rapture. He's talking about the seven year period of, of hiding away in, 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 the, in, the, in our mansions. And then he's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because... It wasn't appointed at that time for people to have all this revealed, but it now is. We live in the New Testament. And the mystery of the church that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3 is being revealed not only to the world, but also to the angels, both holy and fallen. And guess who are the vehicles of that revelation? The apostles and prophets and the church itself. We are showing the angel world the mystery of Christ and the church. And I believe that's why God hates homosexuality, because it's an attempt to defame that relationship of Christ and the church, as described to us in the New Testament. But here, there's a mystery that Paul wants us to know about. Something that once was hidden, but now revealed. Let's keep reading. It says, we shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. Oh, right there. The Bible's got an error. It says, we shall not all sleep, and everybody sleeps. Bible wrong. Throw it out. Must be. Is he talking about sleep? No. 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 It's, a, it's a term for people who die. I point you to John chapter 11, when Jesus was hanging out with his disciples, right? And they get word, Lazarus is sick. And what did Jesus do with the sick? 
Jesus healed the sick. And the disciples expected Jesus Christ to go and heal Lazarus. But Jesus kind of lollygagged. He kind of hung out. He didn't hop on, transi transition, Holy Spirit. He didn't get on his Holy Spirit van and drive right to, to Lazarus' house. He didn't walk on the air to get there. He didn't, you know, just, you know, transport himself. No, he hung out with his disciples for a while. And then after hanging out with his disciples for a while, he goes to his disciples and says, we got to go to Lazarus because he's asleep. And you know what? His disciples, you know, they, well, they say, well, Jesus, if, if he's asleep, he'll, he'll just wake up again. Right? Isn't that the way it works? I mean, come on, Jesus. Aren't you the God of the universe? Aren't you the one who made us? You know how we operate. You know, during the daytime, we're awake and at night we sleep, but we always get up. Right? But Jesus says, no, 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 no. He's dead. And so it's a term for death. And so what Paul is telling us here is that not every believer will, ever, will die. Whoa. Wait a minute, preach. Come on. Everybody dies. No. There is one generation of Christians who will not see death. Now, if we stop right there, that is cool in and of itself. Right? Because as long as we're alive, we could be a part of that generation that will not taste death. Wow. I don't know. I, I, I know that I talk about this a lot, and maybe, maybe some of you become jaded to that concept a little bit. But really think about that. I, you know, as a pastor, youth pastor, as, you know, uh, helping other pastors, assistants, I've watched people die. And I'm here to tell you, it's no fun. And it's hard work. And I want no part of it. Honestly, I don't want to die. When the lightning was striking all around me as I, as I rolled in with my little truck delivering fish and stuff, I was doing one of these. Because <laughs> I don't want to die. I got made fun of because I didn't want to die, but that's okay because, because you know what? I know it's not my time to die. And if I got struck by lightning, then I'd have to deal with the lightning strike and still be alive anyway. So it's like that's a lose-lose situation for me because I know God has work for me to do. And when my work is done, I'll know in my spirit and I'll be able to accept death if that's, if that's what God wants for me. You know, because it, the word says it is appointed unto a man once to die. So there are some Christians who are going to die. In fact, most Christians have died. It's been almost 2,000 years since Jesus Christ told us to watch for his return. It's been almost 2,000 years since Paul wrote this passage. It's been 2,000 years since Paul wrote, almost 2,000 years since Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians 4, where it talks about us being raptured, harpazoed, okay? And yet, in victory we wait. Because we know our God. And you know, some people say, might say, well, preacher, how do you know he's coming back for you? How do you know it's been 2,000 years? Holy Spirit knew that that was going to happen. Peter writes in his letter that there will be scoffers in the last days who will say, oh, everything's gone on since the creation. And it's always going to be the same. They're called universalists. I'm not a universalist, by the way. I'm a catastrophist. In fact, I'm a fiat catastrophist. Because I believe that God is going to invade this world with a catastrophe, and it's called the tribulation. And those who are not in Christ Jesus, those who are not raptured before the tribulation, will be left behind to face the most wicked and evil person of all history. And Daniel and Jesus said it will be the worst time in all of human history because I believe there are going to be freaky things going on. You're going to have the Antichrist performing demonic signs, miracles, and wonders. You're going to have little false Antichrist and little false prophets performing miracles and preaching falsehoods. You're going to have angels flying over the earth preaching the gospel. You're going to have Nephilim on the planet, these huge, demonic, superna half supernatural, half human creatures. There, it's going to be a freaky, weird place. In fact, I believe the world will be so different after the rapture. 
as different as it is from the flood, before the flood, to now. And you want no part of that. Trust me. I've, I've looked at the book. It doesn't look like it's a fun time. Still can get saved. There's still hope. If you get left behind, by the way, and I'm putting this on to you, if, if, if all of a sudden millions of Christians just disappear, you, you people have full right to go in my house, grab a hold of any of my Bibles you want, videos. I got some entertainment ones. You probably won't need those. But anything that talks about the rapture, talks about the tribulation, I've got prophecy books and stuff. They're yours. Because I won't need them. Because I'm going to be in the mezzanine Amen. celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus. That's victory, my friends. That is victory. But anyways, there will be a generation of Christians who will not taste death. In fact, Paul says that we shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. And I looked up that word changed in the Greek, and it comes from the Greek word alasso. I thought of, you know, but if that's not what it's about. Actually, the definition is to exchange one thing for another, to transform. I think of that, that cartoon, the Transformers. Transform! They go from being a little car to this big, bad robot that can beat the bejesus out of just about anything that gets in its path. And you know what? That's victory, my friends. We are going to be transformed. I think our transformation is going to be so radical that the devil is going to look at us and go, <laughs> You know why? Because we will be completely transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians 5, verse 23, And may the God of all peace sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body. Right now, my spirit's sanctified. My soul is in the process of being sanctified. And my body is like, you're dying. You know? It's like a chicken running around with its head that chopped off. This body is going to, one thing that we're all doing together is we're all dying. Oh, bummer, right? Except for the fact for the believer to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Victory! Still a victory. I still prefer not to die, though. Just saying. Jesus. It's my prayer. That's the mystery. And I, I looked up the word dead. Okay? It says that we shall not all sleep. Okay? But we all shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Folks, this is not talking about the trumpet judgments in Revelation. And I can prove it. The trumpet judgments are all about judgment. This trumpet is all about calling the ambassadors of Christ home. That's one of the... Th See, I believe that the reason why so many people misunderstand the rapture and the timing of the rapture is because they don't really understand the nature of the church. We are Christ's ambassadors. The tribulation is God's wrath, God's war against an unbelieving world. That's what Isaiah says. It says, And the Lord shall come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. It doesn't talk about purifying the church or punishing the church for her sins. No, it's for the earth dwellers. John tells us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. The Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, God the Father, wants to transform us into his image. In fact, there are passages in Philippians and 1 John that says that we will become like Christ. Think about that. What can Jesus Christ do right now? Do you know Jesus Christ can materialize in our presence without passing through a window, door, ceiling, floor? He could just beam himself in. It's the only way I can describe it. And then beam himself out. He can go anywhere in the universe that he wants. He is sitting on his father's throne. And if you read Revelation 4 and 5 carefully, guess what? There's a throne waiting for you too. And I'm not talking about the bathroom. I'm talking about a real throne. <laughs> 
Because we are the 24 elders, my friends. The 24 elders represent the church because they declare that they are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb to be kings and priests unto their God from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. They're not angels, and they're not Jews. Well, except those Jews who are part of the church. They're the church. And so... We are going to be transformed. Our corruptible bodies, which are dying, are going to be made renewed. We're going to have eternal bodies. Where we're going to live forever. YouTube land. We are going to get eternal bodies. If you believe in Jesus Christ, that's what's waiting for you. An upgrade. A supernatural upgrade. I can't wait. I can't wait. Death is going to be swallowed up in victory. Let's read on. It says that this will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed, transformed. <laughs> I hear all the special effects. Transformed. Yeah, where's the devil? Because I got Jesus, you know. <laughs> What's he got? He got nothing. And then like my wife would say, Satan, where you at? That's for you, Wendy. <laughs> Wendy says, I never I talk about her in my sermons. I love Wendy. Wendy is awesome. Wendy rocks. She's got a supernatural gift of helps. And she wants to know where all you, where you at? Well, you better be at with Jesus is where you be at. If she has anything to say about it. And so death is going to be swallowed up. And I looked up that word death or dead. And it means... Deceased, departed, one whose soul is in heaven. See, that's the destiny of the Christian. If you were to kill me right now, I'm not asking you to, but I'm saying if you did, I would go to be with Jesus. There's nothing you can do about that. You can't steal that from me. You can't rust that up. You can't, you know, whatever. You, you can't do it. It's an incorruptible treasure it's already in the bank I got a billion Jesus bucks Amen. and then some because my Jesus owns the cattle on a thousand hill he, he owns the whole the whole bank the whole universe the whole shebang you can't rob for me you can try but it isn't gonna work because I've been saved to the uttermost by the blood of the precious Lamb of God. I've not been purchased by, by corruptible money, but by the, by the most incorruptible piece of currency you could ever get, the blood of Jesus. You can't take that away. My sins have been washed away. It is finished for me. I'm just waiting for the Bema seat. That's what I'm waiting for, where my works will be judged. And that's where I'll suffer loss or gain reward. And that's where you will suffer loss and or gain reward at the Bema seat of Christ. Anyway, it says that we shall be transformed, we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. There you go. We're going to be immortal. If you're wondering, why am I here today? Why am I in this world? Well, guess what? God has a plan for you. His plan is that you would understand the mystery of Jesus Christ, that you would understand the mystery of what the church is, that you would become born again of God's Spirit, and that by being born again of God's Spirit, that you would have a mind that is set towards looking for His return. Because in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1, Paul writes, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, I have no need to write unto you, for you yourselves know fully well that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So when they, the world, cries peace and safety, Sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, but it will not come upon us. For you are not children of the darkness, but you are children of the light and children of the day. In fact, Paul includes himself and he goes, we are the children of light and the children. I believe that the church will know when it happens. Because we'll be so, because we have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will do this. But guess what? 
I believe those who will willingly do this will have a special reward waiting for them at the marriage supper of the Lamb, where Jesus himself will serve you. Because he, did he not command us to watch for his return? And he said, those who are watching, I will have them to sit down and I will serve them dinner. Amen. So you Christians who aren't keeping watch, I don't know if you're going to be a part of that dinner. I know you'll be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, but, we'll, but maybe there'll be a special dinner that you're not a part of. Because you're too busy worrying about, you know, oh, I got to worry about this and we're, you know, no, no. We just celebrated the Lord's Supper that says, do this in remembrance of me until I come. Everything about the Christian faith is about Jesus Christ coming. Coming to get us. Coming to deliver, to deliver us from this world, from death. That's the transformation. Now, what is, what is involved in this transformation? I looked up the word brought to pass because it says this. It says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortality must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruptible, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I looked up the phrase brought to pass. And that phrase brought to pass, check this out. It means to come into existence, to begin, to receive being, to come to pass, to happen, to arise, check this out, appear in history, to come upon the stage of men appearing in public, to be made, finished, of miracles to be performed, to become, to be made. And I think of Romans 8, where it says that this creation, which has been put under the curse of sin, that the corruption of the universe will be set free when the sons of God are revealed. You and me being revealed at the rapture, at the second coming. You see, the rapture is for us. It's private. And only loving eyes and loving hands will be a part of the rapture. But the second coming, that's a different story. The second coming is when Jesus Christ comes back in all his glory. And guess who's coming back with him? You are with your immortal, transformed, supernatural, all victorious, undefeatable, immeasurable, incredible, upgrade bodies. Woo! I, you know, if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what can. That excites me. That winds me up. Yes, let's do this Jesus thing. Our victory. What does this, now what, what does this victory do? It says that death is swallowed up in victory. And I looked up that word death. And this is what I got. It's the Greek word thanatos. Sounds ominous. Thanatos. Don't eat that chip. That chip will kill you. Thanatos. Okay. And it means this. Death of the body with the implied idea of future misery and hell, the netherworld was conceived as being very dark and a region enveloped in darkness of ignorance and sin. It is the misery of the soul arising from sin which begins on earth and increases in hell, the miserable state of the wicked dead in hell. In the widest sense, death com com uh, comprising all the miseries arising from sin as well as physical death as the loss of life and which was consecrated to God and blessed in, blessed in him on earth to be followed by wretchedness in hell. Thanatos. Wow. Wretchedness in hell. And what really struck me was the misery of the soul, the miserable state of the wicked dead in hell. If you are not in Christ Jesus, that is your destiny. Misery in hell. A place of darkness. A place of fire. A place where the fire is never quenched. The canker worm is never satisfied. There's a freaky, weird, supernatural canker worm. And if you, if you take a look at what canker worms look like, they're ugly! <laughs> I've looked them up on the internet. 
and though there will be supernatural, ugly canker worms gnawing on your immortal soul for all eternity as you are burning in the fire, miserable in hell. Is that what you want? That's not what I want. I don't care if I lose 70 years of prosperity to avoid that. That price is well worth it. But what does it a profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? I'm speaking to the rich out there. Your money will burn with you. You won't be able to buy your way out of hell. You won't be able to lie your way out of hell. You won't be able to hire lobbyists to get you out of hell. You will burn in hell for all eternity unless Jesus Christ is your Savior. God has given us the way. Right from the beginning, even in the Old Testament, Moses had the people, well actually it was the Lord, but Moses was the leader, he had the people get on two mountains, the mountain of cursing and the mountain of blessing. And they went through curses. If you don't do this, this and this, cursed is you, cursed is you, cursed is you, cursed is you. And then the mountain of blessing. If you do this, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. And then God says, this is death. And this is life. Choose life. You are without excuse out there. You are without excuse in here. I'm without excuse. We know the way. And we either walk in it in obedience or we don't. It's not, there's no in between state. There is no spiritual Switzerland. Either of the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. That's it. Either you serve Jesus or you scatter against Jesus. Either you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit or you walk in the flesh. Either you're trying to earn heaven through corruptible flesh or you're trying to get to heaven on airship Jesus. Rapture service is inquired and given freely to those who will receive him as Lord and Savior. And the victory... This, this victory, what does it do? It swallows up this. I looked up that phrase, swallowed up. I had fun with this. I hope, I hope this is blessing you as, as much as it blessed me. And I looked up the phrase, the phrase, swallowed up. Okay? I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see what I wrote. I looked up the phrase, swallowed up. And it means to drink down, to devour, to swallow up and destroy. And that's the Greek word, capatino. Almost sounds like a, a latte. Give me a capatino. I don't want the thanatos. Give me the capatino. Yes. That's what God wants to do for you. He wants to swallow up. He wants to devour death for you. He wants to destroy death. In fact, it says he wants to drink down death for you. Is that what happened on the cross when Jesus three times prayed to his father, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass for me? I think so. Jesus has already drank down death for you. You don't have to drink from the cup of death. You can be delivered from eternal destruction and despair and misery and hell, if you want to. But let me tell you something, you're not gonna do it by your flesh. There's the, the secret is the Spirit of God. Amen. Joshua and Zerubbabel were told that they couldn't build the temple of God except through, they couldn't do it through power or might, but by the Spirit. Who is the temple of God? The church. The church will not be built by flesh and blood. The church will not be built by power. You Christians out there who want dominion on this earth, you aren't going to build the kingdom of God with your power, with your dominion, so you dominion now theologians. Hit the road, Jack, and don't come back until you realize that it is by the Spirit of God that the temple of God will be built. And, and, and here to the, to, the, to the admonition of that brief genealogy, Yahweh has not forgotten us, Zechariah. Yahweh will bless us, Barakiah, and Yahweh will do it at his appointed time, Edau. Because that's what those names mean. Yahweh blesses, or Yahweh remembers, and Yahweh blesses at the appointed time. 
You see, we want to push the time clock of God ahead. And God says, no. Even the disciples said, hey, Jesus, you're going to establish the, the kingdom of Israel? And he says, it's not for you to know these epochs. You're the church. You wait in Jerusalem for what? The Holy Spirit, who on the day of Pentecost was poured out on all flesh and into the church. That's why I'm driving people crazy out in YouTube land who don't believe in Jesus, because the Holy Spirit on you is saying, he's right, he's right, he's right. And you're like, shut up, shut up, shut up. And that's why those of you who are Christians are going, he's right, he's right, he's right. Because the Spirit of God in you cries out, Abba, Father, with the Holy Spirit. It's not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Whew. The victory. Now, I looked up that word, victory... It means to utterly vanquish. God drank the cup of wrath and utterly vanquished death, hell, the misery. There is a pardon out there for you for the taking. But the thing is, a pardon has to be taken. It has to be accepted. There have been people on death row who governors have pardoned and they refused the pardon. Guess what? They got executed because that's what the law required. And the law says you sin, you die. The law says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The law says that the, that the, that the fruits of, of, of sin is death and separation from God. There's a death sentence over humanity. But the, that's the sad part. But the good part is Jesus has already drank that death sentence for you. You don't have to go to hell. God doesn't want to send you to hell. God doesn't want the wicked to perish. He loves you. He wants you to become one of his children. I quote the beloved apostle John. John 1, verses 11 through 13, says he, that's Jesus, came to his own, that's the Jews, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him. To them he gave the power to become the sons of God, who are not born by the will of man, nor by the will of flesh, but born by the will of God. You must be born again, Jesus said, of the spirit and the water, otherwise you can't enter the kingdom. See how it all just comes together? Well, let's take a look at, at the victory. In verse 55, it says, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know something about that word victory? It's used three times in this passage. In verse 54, 55, and 57. It's almost like God is emphasizing, I come to give you victory. Hello, I come to give you victory. Hello! I come to give you victory. Because we need to pound it into our heads, right? Doesn't Paul say, rejoice always again? I say rejoice. Didn't Paul say, it's profitable for you, for me to remind you of these things? Because why? Because we have our flesh who buys into, did God say? We live in a world that says, did God say? And we have an adversary who says, did God say? And then goes even further and says, no, this is what he really means. He doesn't want you to become God. Isn't that what the world is telling everyone out there? The new age, we're all gods. Aren't they, the new agers telling people that the Christians are holding back the rest of the world from becoming gods? It's a lie. It's a lie. Jesus gives us the victory. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> so what is the conclusion of this? If we have victory, what should we do? Verse 58 spells it out. You know, I've been told, oh, Nelson, you're such a rapture maniac. You're all so heavenly minded. You're no earthly good. Well, guess what? Here's a very earthly good verse attached to a very heavenly minded passage. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor 
is not in vain in the Lord. What's the conclusion of this great victory that we have? We need to be steadfast. Are you steadfast? Do you stand up against the lies of the world when they say, oh, there's no Jesus, there's no rapture, there's no heaven? We need to be steadfast. He says we're, we need to be immovable. Are you immovable on what God has said to you through his holy scriptures? Do you receive it like a child, just believing that it's true no matter what science may tell you, no matter what politicians may tell you, no matter what even the president may tell you? We are to abound all the more in the Lord's work. Why? Because when we do the Lord's work, it's not in vain. I, you know what, if, even if you guys hated this message and, and you all walked out of here even before it was over and said, ah, preacher is dumb, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he's stupid, and see you later, alligator, it doesn't matter. I stand up here and preach anyways because my labor in God's not in vain. Because I believe that when we preach the word of God, it goes into the heavenlies. It goes into the hearts of human people. Why? Because the Holy Spirit living inside of us, living inside of me, Jesus in me is greater than he who is in the world. And although Satan is a squatter and he's the God of this present age, he's going to be removed from power. And even though he's got his boy, the Antichrist, hanging in the wings. And, I, you, know, I, you know what the Holy Spirit showed me about that? Every generation of the church, the devils had to raise up someone. God's making the devil work. I like the fact that God's making the devil work. <laughs> because he doesn't know the day or the hour either. Jesus made it very clear. The rapture is imminent. The doctrine of imminency. We don't know the day or the hour. You can't prophetically predict. I wish my good friend, Miss Reverend Camp, would get that through his thick head. If the dude's even still alive. Dude! Read the book. It says no man knows the day or the hour. Stop making predictions. I love you. I love the fact that you're zealous about the rapture, but stop predicting, will you? Aye. <laughs> but we are to look. And I close with this. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, We are to wait for the Son from heaven, whom God raised from the dead, even Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath which is to come. Jesus is going to rescue us from that seven-year seven wrath. He's going to rescue us from eternal wrath. The church has no part in the wrath of God. None of it. None. Because in the book of Hebrews, it says that Christ suffered once the wrath of God. And we are the, his body. He is the head. If we are suffering the wrath of God, he is suffering the wrath of God. Not going to happen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for <laughs> pumping my body up. Oh man, I was like dogging it on the way up the mountain. But you are an awesome God. And you jacked me up. And you excite me more than anything. Yeah, I'm a football fan. I get excited when my teams win the Super Bowl. But I get way more excited about Jesus coming back. Because he is my goal. He is my path. He is my Savior, my Lord, my God. And if there's anyone here, and you're not born again, and you'd like Jesus Christ to come into your heart, I want to give you an opportunity to say, yeah, I want Christ in my heart. Maybe you've done it before, but you're not sure, and you want to make sure, and if that's you, raise your hand and say, Jesus, I want you to come in my heart and make me a new creature. Anyone? And you people out on YouTube, you can do this now too. You can ask Christ in your heart. Father, I pray for anyone who may lift up their hands in YouTube land. Father, that they would be truly born again. I pray that your kingdom would be built, that your will would be done. Father, we thank you for the victory that, ours is, that is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Father, I pray that this church would continue to be a beacon of that truth that we would continue to tell people, be ready because the Son of Man is coming back at a day and an hour you don't know. And Lord, I pray that we would continue to preach the gospel and we would continue to teach the Word of God and that we would continue to be a light set on a mountain. Father God, as individuals, give us divine appointments and opportunities. And once again, I do lift up my, my, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, Neil and Nancy. I ask that you would save them. Father God, I ask that you would do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you'd go before us and be with us as we continue 
celebrating America's 238th birthday. Lord, thank you for America. Thank you for the liberty of America. Your word says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But the first part of that verse says the Lord is spirit. And so wherever you are, God, there is liberty. And so, Lord, I thank you for, for godly founding fathers who, who, who gave us an inheritance of a godly country. And Lord, I pray that we would return to that foundation, Father God. I pray that our people would become educated in the Word of God and in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, Father, because we've wandered afar from all those. But the most important thing is we need to be educated in God's Word. And so, Father, my prayer is that your word would just flow through this nation, that there would be a revival of the word of God, that the, that the preachers would catch on fire, that they would preach the whole gospel of God. And I pray that the pagans would get saved and repent and be born again, Father, and that the Christians would catch on fire and repent and be, and be jacked up for your glory. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. If you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's spirit, Today is the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now, and if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus. Accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, Happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, We'll see you next week, and may God bless you all the days of your life.